and so continue to lift up Julia Pat Huffman's niece uh, during these days as well. Susan Disler had a, just a, we called her yesterday when Debbie and I were traveling back and then she texted us. She said she's doing better since her uh, recent asthma attack. She had the first good night's sleep in 10 days, she said, um, two nights ago. So praise the Lord for that, but she's uh, continuing to recover. We're grateful uh, for that. We have two prayer blankets up here this morning to be praying over. First of all, the one all the way to my left at the edge of the stage is, is for Anna Godby. Anna is in a critical place right now with a blood clot. She is Josephine Powell's sister, and they are trying to dissolve that clot. So she's got to remain still so it doesn't break up and um, cause some potential damage or even worse. So remember, Anna, that prayer blank is going to be going to her. The prayer blank closest to me is going to be going to Bobby Simpson. Many of you already know that yesterday afternoon, Bobby went, was taken to Rome Memorial Hospital, um, had a heart attack, but actually didn't have a heart attack. He had two at the same time in two different parts of his heart. And the doctor said they, they rarely see that. Um, but Bobby is doing better. They put in two stents. He had two arteries that were completely blocked. So they did two stents yesterday afternoon. And they're going to check him again Thursday. There was another one that they said was about 50% or so. They just want to double check that. So Bobby will probably be in the hospital at least until Wednesday. He uh, called Chloe at 6 a.m. to make sure she knew what to do with the cow. <laughs> so he's doing well. He's doing much better. Uh, Aaron Humphreys, Aaron, thank you for leading the cleanup crew here yesterday. And, uh, the, the properties look great. Thank you uh, for that. Also, we have a, a praise for our uh, Dominican Republic yard sale went well. Thank you all that either donated or purchased things. They raised over $4,000, I think, yesterday to help for that ministry and that, or yesterday and Friday. And that is a huge blessing. Today is a special day. I don't know if you realize that or not. But for us, as Christians, it's a really special day. It was on this date in 1517 that Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the Wittenberg door. Martin Luther was a Catholic monk who once grace out of the book of Romans got a hold of him. He said, we're doing this wrong, bro. And the Pope didn't like that. And so Luther put these theses together, he began the Reformation movement that we are recipients of now in our faith tradition. And so I always like today, it's a wonderful day, and the fact that it fell on Sunday this year is way cool, and the fact that I'm not preaching about it, um, you can decide. <laughs> it struck me this morning, I like, probably should have done something anyway, so I just did. Um, I see what that's a, what else am I missing here? Oh, our prayer person for this week, I'm not sure if it's, we're praying for him or we're praying for us. But anyway, Don Johnson is our prayer person. Uh, but Don, we appreciate you and, and all that, that you do. Don is, is jumped right in to the life. Don brings the party. Yes. Brings the party to Mill Creek. <laughs> Leading by example. Thank you, Don, for that. But Donnie is our prayer person for this week, so remember Donnie uh, in your prayers as well. And I'm sure you have some on your heart. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I would invite you to either lift some of these up that the Spirit lays on your heart, or maybe there's one that the Spirit has laid on your heart that's personal that you want to pray over this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we do come before you thanking you for the many ways in which we experience you and the blessings that we receive. Father, we give you thanks for those that were here yesterday tending to your house, helping it to look beautiful, Father, because we want it to be beautiful for you. So, Father, thank you for the group of folks who came to help serve and clean up and do some sprucing up around here. Bless them, Lord. Father, we thank you for the support with the yard sale and what that will do for the Dominican Republic. We pray for Hernan and those who are ministering in the DR. And, Father, we pray that um, you would continue to bless and watch over them and that we would be a blessing to them. Father, we thank you that Bobby was able to get the attention he needed yesterday. Father, that they were able to do these stents and take care of his heart and Lord, now we look forward to recovery for him. Father, pray you continue to watch care over him. Lord, pray this blessing is just a reminder of this blanket is just a reminder of his church that loves him and is praying for him. 
work for Anna Daphne, for Josephine's sister, for what she's experiencing right now with this blood clot, Lord. We pray that the medications will dissolve it, do what they're meant to do. Uh, we pray that you'll be able to remain still so that uh, that won't have any adverse effects. And again, Lord, that this blanket would be a reminder, that it would be a symbol of hope and encouragement for her as she receives it, and as she's waiting for the medications to do what they're meant to. Finally, we lift up others on our list. We think of Julia. We think of others who are experiencing COVID and other difficulties right now. We just need a healing touch from you. And Lord, we pray that they would experience your presence in a powerful way. Lord, for Amanda Cameron, for her parents, and all that she's going through in this time, in which we assume, Lord, of her final days here, Lord, we pray that you would be gracious and merciful and compassionate. Father, we lift her up and those who are caring for her right now. Lord, for Donnie, for what he means to our church family, Father, for many ways in which he does just share your light and your love in this place and in the community, Father, we give thanks. We pray your blessings on him this week and the various things that he has going on. Lord, for Mark Luther, Lord, we give you thanks for your spirit revealing truths to him that he could not keep silent about. And Father, here we are. And so we thank you for the reformation that began over 500 years ago now. And Lord, pray your blessings on us as we continue to move forward in sharing the gospel message. Be with us, Father, as we look into your word, as we continue to worship. Speak to our hearts, open us up, reveal areas in our life that you're desiring to work on. And then, Father, help us to surrender those areas to you and allow you to do your good work in us. Father, we pray for this time of worship that it would be a sweet aroma that's lifted to your throne room this morning. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen and living Savior, that we pray. Amen. Alexis will come uh, forward now and uh, she's going to sing for you and play for you. Thanks. I'm sorry. So I'll still word. Oh, no, he's told us. Okay. <laughs> he didn't steal my stool. He just took it. He just, he <laughs> <laughs> he just took it. Uh, so this is Alexis Chocolate. She goes to James River High School. She's been taking lessons for a while. It's, so it's quite a privilege for me to uh, introduce her. And it's always such an honor when my students get to a, a place where they're doing Christian songs and gospel songs and, and are able to play in church. And I told the other, earlier crowd that uh, uh, Lexi used to be super shy. Not that she's super outgoing now, but she's, she's a little bit shy now, but uh, she used to have stage fright and she got over that. And, uh, I think this song kind of tells us a little bit about how she's trusting in God these days. And she's really trusting God that uh, she's using her talent here today for, and uh, where she used to be so shy. I only knew how shy she used to be. But, uh, she used to sing like at a whisper. And, uh, we got over that. And so I'm so very proud of Lexi that she shares her gift of talent. And I think she's going to tell you what she's going to be playing. Uh, would you for you? Bye, my 
take your Bibles this morning. We're going to turn to two passages, so you're going to want something to mark with. i get that mark, because our first passage is going to be Mark chapter 12. Uh, we're going to be looking at finishing up this dialogue that, that Jesus had with one of the teachers of the law. So Mark chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 28 to 34. You'll want to put a paper, a bulletin, a finger, something right there. And then you're going to want to flip back a few books into the Old Testament to Micah. Micah chapter 6. If you're looking for Micah, it's right after Jonah. If you find Jonah in the whale, Micah's not far behind and it's right there. So Micah chapter 6, you'll want to have both of those um, available this morning as we begin looking at what does God want from us? We're continuing this journey of discovering the things that we should be focusing on. Because in today's society, it can be so easy for Christ followers as individuals or as the church corporately to get sidetracked, to get off focus, to get derailed from the things that we ought to be doing, that God calls us to be doing. We're following Scripture. We're allowing it to remind us of what some of the main things are that we should be doing. Stephen Covey said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So we're looking at some main things that Scripture says and how we can be living those out today in our world. We began by looking at the fact that we're called to make disciples in our daily life as we go through life. And that looks different every day, really, for me when I stop to think about it. Making disciples is different. It's not the same thing day in and day out. There are some similarities, but also vast differences. 
we looked at what does it mean to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then also, what does it mean to love our neighbors as ourselves? We looked at that last week by looking at the, the story of the Good Samaritan. Because according to Jesus, loving God and loving others are the two primary things that we should be focused on. When we love God and love others, everything else just tends to come into focus for us. When these become the filter through which we live, everything else seems to become clearer. So this morning, we're going to look at the third aspect of this conversation that Jesus had with the teacher, of, or, or, or the teacher of law in Mark. There are three different parts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then this third part that we're going to see this morning. And so follow along with me, if you will, picking it back up there at Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law had heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him of all the commandments, which is the most important. Sounds like a main thing kind of question. What's the main thing? What's the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So last two weeks, we've looked at what does it mean to do that? Pay attention to this next part of that. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. When he started the conversation... The teacher of the law was simply a tool that the Pharisees and the religious leaders were using to get at Jesus, to try to get him out of focus, to try to get him sidetracked from the ministry that he was about. They were trying to derail him and find evidence against him. But after he heard Jesus answer, after the man, the, the teacher of the law, the one who understood the law so well that he taught others. After the teacher of the law heard Jesus answer, he had the boldness to compliment Christ's response. I want you to get this picture in your head. The Pharisees and the religious leaders are using him as a tool to trip Jesus up. They got his back, if you know what I mean. It's like they were saying, all right, bud, end the game. It's your turn. Go get him, cowboy. And so he does. He goes up to Jesus and they have this conversation. Well, Jesus answers and what's, the, what's the, the, the teacher of the law say? Wow, you've answered really well. He complimented Christ's response. And you've got to believe that at that moment, all the rest of the Pharisees are going, did, did, he, did he really? Well, no, no, oh no, he didn't. They had to be going, what is going on here? The Old Testament, or what would have been the scriptures, the law that this teacher knew really well, taught that there was more to the Jewish faith than simply offering sacrifices. There was more to the Jewish faith than just keeping the laws. 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel said, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 51, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a contrite heart. You, God, will not despise Jeremiah reminded the people that God didn't just give them commands about sacrifices and burnt offerings, but about obeying those commands as well. 
Hosea said that God desired mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Are you getting the picture that God wants us to be obedient yet? All throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the scriptures that the teacher of the law would have known, it's what we see. Obedience, obedience, obedience is what God desires. So now flip over to Micah chapter 6. We're going to look at one verse. It's in the middle of a, a story that we're going to grow to understand. But here's what Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Sounds like we're getting into a main thing kind of question. Keep the main thing the main thing. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, you, you, you need to know Michael was a prophet who understood he was sensitive to the ways that the Israelites were living during this time. Like so many people today, the Israelites had become comfortable in their life. They'd become comfortable in their relationship with God. And as a result, they, they tended to kind of put God on the back burner of their life. They began to forget all of the things that, that God had done for them. They were living their lives how they wanted to, rather than living their lives in obedience and according to God's desires. It was all about what do we want and Michael was so broken over the sins of the people that if you go back to chapter 1 and start reading, it says this. He was so broken as a result of their sin that he began to strip naked, shave his head, and weep and wail and howl like a jackal and moan like an owl in the streets. That's how broken he was over their sin. So in Micah fashion, just my wife's going... Don't do it. I'm not going to do it, Mom or Debbie. <laughs> but I am broken. I'm broken over sin. I'm broken over my sin. I'm broken over our sin. In the first five chapters of Micah, God reveals what's about to happen. Because of the way that the Israelite nation was living at this time, God, Micah begins to prophesy through God that judgment is coming. Not just judgment, but impending doom. It's about to get ugly up in here because of what you are doing and how you are living. And then we get to this sixth chapter, and we end up in what appears to be this courtroom scene. I mean, why not go back to a courtroom scene when we've got a teacher of the law who's testing Jesus anyway? And so we get back to this courtroom scene, and God is beginning to lay out his case against the Israelites. In the first five verses of Micah chapter 6, is God, God putting his case out there before him. God has called his people to be judged, and he says this. First of all, he says, state your case against me. What have I done that has caused you to live this way? Tell me. Help me understand. State your case. And then he says this, I have a complaint against you. I have done all I can do for you, yet you have rejected me. I brought you out of Egypt. I led you through the wilderness. I have protected you from your enemies, and yet you turn your back on me. What more could I have done? And then in verses 6 through 8, the people answer, yeah, you're right, you're right, God, we've sinned. How can we make up for all that we've done? We could bring sacrifices, but sacrifices aren't, sacrifices aren't enough to wash away. Sacrifices aren't enough to cleanse us of all of our sins. All the religion can never save us. And even if we sacrificed our firstborn, even if we sacrificed our own children, it's not enough to cleanse us for our sinful nature for the way that we've been living our lives. We know what God wants us to do. We also know what God doesn't want. God doesn't want extravagant gifts and sacrifices. What God wants is our hearts, is what the people were saying. Micah isn't saying that sacrifices made to God are bad. What he is saying is this, if all we do is simply go through the motions of faith, 
If all we do is show up on occasion and give God a few moments of our time, of our energy, of our resources, if all we do is just give him a little bit, just enough to satisfy that proverbial life insurance policy so that we get that ticket to heaven, then there's something wrong with what we're doing and how we're doing it. It's meaningless to God. A lot of people today think that showing up for church and offering God that little bit is enough, but it's not. It wasn't for them. It's not for us. And so Micah was known for being practical. He didn't just pronounce gloom and doom. He helped the people to understand, here's what you can do about it. And so he talked about faith in a way that lets his listeners know what God expects. What God expects on a day-by-day -day basis, not an occasional Sunday-only basis. But here's what God expects from us as his followers, as his children, as his people on a regular basis. And one of the major ways that the Israelites had messed up was in the area of personal and social morality. They weren't treating one another kindly. Not only were they not treating one another kindly, they weren't treating the foreigners among them kindly. And as always, this was not pleasing to God. If we're called to love God and love others, they were not doing the love others part. They really weren't doing the love God because they weren't doing what God had commanded them to do. And so Micah's message calls us to repent of our sins and to live decent and obedient lives. God doesn't want our sacrifices. He doesn't want our burnt offerings. He wants our hearts. He wants us to be obedient and listening to and following him. It calls us to be good people, to live out our faith, not only in how we worship God, but in how we treat others. If we love God, we're going to experience his love inside of us, and what comes out of us ought to be that love extended toward others. Remember, John said we love because he first loved us. And so as a result of us experiencing the love of God, now we want to share that love with other people. We didn't deserve it, and we got it. Now we want to give it to somebody who may not deserve it as well. A loving relationship with God enables us to have a loving relationship with other people. And so it begins right there with our love for God. Personal and social morality remain tough issues today. It doesn't take long to figure out that we're in a mess. But it also doesn't take long to figure out it's nothing new. If Micah is telling the Israelites you've messed up, Socially and morally, you've messed up. Then it's nothing new. Maybe how it's done is something new. The writer of Ecclesiastes said there's nothing new under the sun, and every time I think there is, there's really not. I come back to see it in Scripture. Every one of us struggles with right attitudes and actions in our lives at times. We also struggle with getting past the wrong attitudes and actions of others. Micah gives us three things to work on. Three things that will help us when it comes to living decent and obedient lives in a secular and pagan society. And the first one is this. Micah says, what does the Lord require of you? Act justly. What does it mean to act justly? It means to do what is right all the time. Do what is right all the time. It doesn't matter whether you're at school or at work. It doesn't matter whether you're at home or on the playing field, in your marriage, in the church. God is calling us to do what is right. What does he require? Not recommend. What does he require? Do what's right. Mark Twain said it's never wrong to do the right thing. C.S. Lewis said, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Y'all, I, I am sick and tired. I'm not just tired. I'm not just sick. I'm sick and tired of the political correctness involved in our society today. I'm sick and tired that we are bending and catering to the world's views rather than God's views. But we're at fault. 
when we're not living the way that God calls us to live. We're at fault when we don't act justly. We can't disregard God's plans and God's commands and God's desires and expect God to bless us in our relationships with others. There's a lot of confusion in the world today about what's right. And so we say things like, you be you. Well, if I say you be you, then I have just disregarded myself because if you do something that bothers me, you're being you. And now I can't be me. And so the morality is this thing that continues to be fluid in society when in reality it's not. God's truth is truth no matter what. And we need to look at it and act with that in mind. We've moved from doing what this book says to doing what we want. And that's exactly where the Israelites were when Micah was prophesying to, him, to them. What's right for you may not be right for me. But I can tell you this, what's in this book is right all the time. Because it never changes. Unlike our views and opinions do. There was a lot of injustice going on when Micah wrote this. Verses 9 through 13 reference they were using disobedient or dishonest scales. They were lying. They were cheating. Deceitness was rampant among God's people. And when the people would come to purchase grain, the sellers would have their hands on the scales. They would misrepresent what they were selling. They were cheating others. And to make matters worse, it was typically those who needed it the most and had the least to offer that were being cheated. But you be you. I had a conversation not too long ago. I don't think I've shared this with you all. I've shared it with a lot of people because it just it continues to blow my mind. I called our internet provider at home because our internet was really slow. And I was talking to this person on the phone and I said, look, I, I've done you know, fast.com and these things to check our speed and we're supposed to be getting, now I realize we're, we're paying for the lowest internet speed, I understand that, but we're supposed to be getting like 25 meg a second. And we're lucky if we're getting 5 to 10 megasecond. And this person on the other end listened to me and then said this. With COVID going on, no one is getting what they pay for. And I thought for a second. And I said, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? With COVID going on, no one is getting what they pay for. And I said, I don't mean to be rude, but does that sound stupid to you? <laughs> because here's the deal. I've got a car. It runs really well. It's a beautiful car. Cherry red. Da, 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 all this stuff. Would you like to buy it? Well, sure, I'll buy it. Okay. And all of a sudden you get it and there's no engine in it. Well, I mean, you don't get what you pay for today. Right? I mean, isn't that... It just sounded, I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me that that is good for you. Dis they would be misrepresenting. When Micah says that we should act with fairness and honesty and integrity, it's easy, it's easy to look around and say, okay, well, I can act with fairness, honesty, and integrity, but man, there is corporate greed, there is political corruption all around us. We can point it out everywhere else. But then I've got to stand back and go when those same things are in me if I let them be. I can be greedy. I can be corrupt if that's what I feed in my life. Our doing what is right is important to God and we need to be examples of what it means to be fair. We need to be examples of what it means to be honest with others in a world that is corrupt and floundering. And so God says, act justly. Do what's right no matter who's watching or when it is, no matter who's got your back. I got to tell you, I am so proud of parents and educators in Loudoun County that are standing up to the school board there. And I hope that the parents and teachers in Botetot would be just as bold if that time comes. But you have teachers who are saying, I'm not going to lie to students. 
I'm not going to tell them something that's not right. And they're standing, they're acting justly is all they're doing. <sighs> Should have taken blood pressure medicine this morning. <laughs> Integrity is at the heart of what it means to follow God. How we deal with and treat other people is what matters, especially with strangers. Because what, how we deal with them is how we deal with God. How we deal and look at other people is how we think about God because that's what it is. We can't separate our beliefs from our behaviors. It's impossible. It's what Jesus' message in the parable of the Good Samaritan last week was. He said, you can't, you can't say you believe one thing and do another. Because what you do is what you actually believe. It's what was going on in Israel, and it's exactly what's going on in the church today. A lot of folks are saying they believe one thing, and then they're going outside these walls and doing things differently. There was a butcher who was asked one time, how did his life change once he became a Christian? And he simply said this, I quit weighing my thumb. He said every time somebody would purchase meat, he'd put the meat on the scale and leave his thumb on there too, which added an ounce or two. He said once I became a Christian, I started putting more meat than they were paying for because I, I knew I needed to pay back. I knew I needed to give back. I knew I needed to act honestly. God doesn't suggest we do the right thing. Micah says he requires it. In our relationship with God as well as others, act justly. Do the right thing always. No matter who's watching. No matter where you are. Act justly. What does the Lord require of you? Love mercy. Notice it doesn't say have mercy. It says to love mercy. The, the Hebrew word translated mercy literally also means kindness. Love being kind. Love showing kindness to other people. So mercy is compassion. Or put another way, it's love in action. It's demonstrated by loving and giving to others even when it may not be observed. It's doing the right thing out of love for God and other people. We saw this played out last week in the story of the Good Samaritan. It's easy or easier at times to help somebody we know. Oh, you need a hand? Sure, I'd be more than happy to help. I'm, no problem at all. Oh, don't worry about bringing it. No, I don't. God, no, 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 no. It's a gift. It's just as easy to ignore or easier to ignore someone we don't know or maybe even somebody we dislike. Nope. In Luke 6, 35 to 36, Jesus said, Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. What does the Lord require of you? Love, mercy. Don't just like it. What the Samaritan did helps us better understand what it means to love mercy. It's a picture of Jesus' ministry to us. The Samaritan identified with the needs of the stranger and he had compassion on him. Listen, y'all, there was no logical reason for the Samaritan to completely derail his plans at that moment. There was no logical explanation for the Samaritan to give out of his pocket, for the Samaritan to stop and help this enemy of his. There was no logical reason that the Samaritan would take his time to do all of this stuff. It's what we see in Christ and in his ministry as well. Jesus showed us the ultimate example of mercy 
None of us deserve salvation. Scripture says that we are all sinners. Yet because of God's mercy and God's grace, Christ allowed himself to be sacrificed on our behalf and we can receive salvation and forgiveness and accept Christ as our personal Savior. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's mercy. That's kindness in action. And with that as the standard by which mercy is measured, it's going to be difficult it's going to be difficult for me and for you to find a situation where we're not commanded to be merciful towards someone else. God calls on his people to love kindness or mercy. We're to be people who love others with God's own heart. After all, Jesus said the world is going to recognize us as his followers by our love for others. That's how we're recognized. We're not recognized by wearing a Christian shirt or Christian jewelry or doing good. We're recognized, Jesus says, by our love. It's the distinctive pattern of the heart that's committed to God. Mercy doesn't take the time to look at what caused the problem. Mercy is concerned with making it better. And so we love mercy. Mercy. When our heart's been touched by the love of God, compassion, forgiveness, and love for others is what flows out. It's a natural byproduct of what has come in. We're required to do the right thing. We're required to be kind, to love kindness. What does the Lord require of you? To walk humbly with your God. If we don't walk with God, those first two are going to be really difficult or, or unable to do at all. It was the underlying issue in, Michael's, in Micah's day. They had walked away from God. They were no longer walking humbly with him. They had gone their own way. They were making their own decisions, living their own lives. And when we allow God less and less access in our lives, sin is going to fill that void. Anytime there's a void, something seeks to fill that spot. It's why potholes have water in them. It's a void that needs filled. And so when we allow God less and less access to our lives, sin fills that void. We see, my goodness, just look around, people. It's rampant in society. When we have taken God out of everything, Satan is willing to step in. He can't defeat God, but he surely can step in and take the place when we open that spot up. God's requirement is that we walk humbly with Him, that we acknowledge His sovereignty, that we acknowledge His leadership, that we acknowledge His Lordship over our lives. We can't go our own way, do our own thing, and be our own person and still expect God to bless it. The blessing is in walking with God, not asking God to walk with us. Walking with God includes but is not limited to a healthy prayer life. Do you pray and do you see others pray? Do you pray with others? If you'd like to, the first Wednesday night of every month. Oh, it's this Wednesday. The first Wednesday night of every month before our adult Bible study at 6.30, we meet at 5.45. Anybody who wants to, to pray. Love to invite you to come and be a part of that time. Walking humbly with God happens through prayer life because we're in communication with God. Walking humbly with God requires us to be in fellowship with other believers, to be in worship, to be in small group Bible studies, to participate where we're able to dig deep into God's word and discover what he says rather than listening to the world. We get fed so much garbage from the world that Christians accept because they don't know what God wants. They haven't taken the time to walk humbly with Him. And so it involves prayer. It involves getting into God's Word and studying it. When we do these things, we begin to walk with God because all of a sudden we're seeing who we are in comparison to who He is. We're recognizing that we're the created. He's the creator. We would be nothing without Him. And when we do that, all of a sudden it humbles us and we want to walk with Him. Remember, walking is a verb. It requires action. It's not just something we can sit and do on a Sunday morning and then go out and, and, and it's just going to happen. 
It requires action on our part. Henry Blackaby, in Experiencing God, said, you cannot walk with God and stay where you are. It's impossible. If you're walking with God, you'll be growing in your relationship with Jesus. You'll also be ministering to others in some form or fashion. You're going to want to because you're loving God and loving others. The people of Micah's time had quit walking with God. And their lives revealed that. It's not rocket science to look around our society today and go, people have quit walking with God. Because of the mess we're in. To walk with God means keeping the relationship alive. It means remaining by His side. It means we're content going in the same direction as God, walking in the same path that God is taking, listening to His voice rather than all the voices of the world around us. It's God, what do you want me to do? Father, how do you want me to respond in this situation? God, how can I stand up against the theories that the world is peddling compared to the truths that I find in your word? God, help me in that. What does God require? He requires us to do what's right, to act justly. He requires us to love mercy or kindness. He requires us to walk humbly, know our place and our relationship with Him. Now flip back to that Mark chapter 12 passage. Look at verse 32 and following. After Jesus responded to the teacher's question, Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one. And there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he, the, the, the teacher of law, that he had answered wisely, he said to him, get this, you are not far from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be not far from the kingdom of God? I think it means two things. First of all, I think it means this. It means that we are facing the truth of God honestly. We're not interested in defending a party line, people. We are not interested in our personal prejudices. We're interested in what the kingdom of God is interested in. It means that we are living out our faith by what the Word of God says and not by what some religious group demands and not by what society is trying to peddle. To be near the kingdom of God means that we are desiring to be with the king of the kingdom. It means we're taking an honest look. We're facing the truth of God honestly. But I think to be near the kingdom of God can also mean this. We can be really close to the kingdom and still not in it. There's a lot of pew sitters in churches today that think they're in the kingdom. And one day they're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and they're going to hear, depart from me, I never knew you. And they're going to say, but didn't we say, Lord, Lord? You said you didn't do. We can be so close to the kingdom and still not in it. And that scares me because I don't want to see anybody end up in hell for eternity. Lord knows it's hell enough here on earth. I want to see somebody there for eternity. So how close to the kingdom are you? Are you in it? Or are you just near it? What does God require? Oh my People close to the kingdom have the courage to stand up for what's true. Even if they lose friends and make enemies along the way. In the end, I'm accountable to God. That's it. So if I offend you, get over it. I hate to put it that way. I mean, I care, don't get me wrong. 
care, but I'm not going to bow. What does the Lord require? Do what is right always. Love showing kindness. Stay in step with God rather than going your own way. It's the main thing, y'all. It's the main thing. Lord, thank you. Father, sometimes words like this are difficult to hear because they remind us of what we're not doing. I know for me, God, I look at the Israelites and what Micah said to them, and I can get so caught up in what they were doing that I forget that I can tend to do the same things. So Lord, help me. Help me to stay near the kingdom by staying near to the king. Father, help me to act justly, to do what is right, because I'm staying near you. Father, help me to love kindness because it's what you do. Father, help me to always see myself for who I am in comparison to who you are so that I stay humble. Bless us, Lord Jesus, we pray. Speak to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you've never experienced the grace and mercy that Christ died on a cross to give you, what's keeping you from that? What's keeping you from inviting Jesus to come in? If you'd like to know more about what that looks like, I'll be right here. If you're online, connect with me. I would love to share Jesus with you. If you want to come while we sing and let me share, I'll be happy to. Maybe the Spirit's been speaking to you as we look into God's Word. Remember, we're allowing God's Word to show us the main things. Not Danny. But the Holy Spirit through God's Word to reveal things in our lives. Y'all, I have wrestled with this all week because I fall short in all three of these. But I don't want to. I want to do better. And so all week long, I've been praying, Lord, help me. Help me, Father. Help me to do what's right. Lord, help me to love kindness. Lord, help me to be humble in your presence. Lord, help me, help me. And so maybe the Lord's just been speaking to you and you need to take care of business this morning before you leave this place. Because I'm telling you, if the Spirit's speaking to you, Satan is right there saying, no, just, 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 just. You, don't, you don't want people to wonder what you've done. You don't want people to wonder what's going on. You just, just, just take care of it and don't. Mm -mm. And so you leave here wishing you had taken care of business. And then you get out there and you get distracted and busy again. And Satan wins. If you've got some business to take care of, whether it's in your pew, whether it's here at the altar, if you'd like me to pray with you, take care of it. You'll be miserable if you don't. We are going to seek to be obedient as the people of Mill Creek Baptist Church. I always say, it's not about where I feel like we need to be going. It's about where I feel God is calling us to go. And I'm not going to do it if God's not calling us. And so if you want to be part of the Mill Creek family is together we seek to walk humbly with God. And we seek to do what's in God's word. And you'd like to know more about what it means to be part of this family, come and talk to me. I'd love to share that with you. If you have some other decision to make today and you just want us to celebrate with you in it, as we stand and close this hour out, I would encourage you to do that. My goal, my desire in my life is higher ground. Not to stay where I am, but to continue to move closer to the kingdom. Higher ground every day. Can you do that? Let's stand and sing. And if you have a decision to make, I'll be right here. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying at some onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay though some may dwell where these abound my prayer my aim is higher ground lord lift me up and let me 
stood by faith on earth with stable land a higher place than I have found Lord plant my feet on higher ground I challenge you with something I challenged the first hour with this week the moment your eyes opened the consciousness of the new day before your feet ever touched the floor I want to challenge you to say a prayer simply like this Lord thank you for this new day Father I'm getting ready to enter into it Lord help me to act justly no matter who's around or who's watching Father help me to show kindness every opportunity you give me and Lord, before my feet hit the ground, I want to say, I want to walk humbly with you today. I don't want to get ahead. I don't want to get behind. I don't want to get away from. Lord, I want to walk humbly with you today. So let's do this in Jesus' name. Amen. And see what he does with that prayer. Lord God, we're leave, getting ready to leave the safety and security of your presence in this place and head out into a world that's filled with confusion and chaos. Father, we have your word. We have your spirit guiding us and leading us. So, Father, help us to be distinctly different from the world is what Scripture is all about. Loving our enemies, Lord, that's not what the world says, but it's what you call us to. So, Father, help us as we leave this place to act justly, to do what's right. Father, help us as we leave this place to look for opportunities to just show people kindness, to love them with kindness. Father, help us as we leave this place not to get ahead of you, but to walk humbly with you. And Father, to be the change agents you've called us to be in society, Lord, it's time for Christians to speak up and out. It's time for us to live out these main things. So God, help us as we leave this place to do just that. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one to whom we're accountable for, the one whom we'll stand before, the one who is living at the right hand of you right now. It's in his name that we go and we pray. Amen. Have a blessed weekend.